You are listening to the Mark Guzman Podcast Experience. Before we get started, just a reminder that you can find all of my available rental properties on my website at markguzman.com. If you own investment property, click on the owner services section to see our complete list of services. This episode and wine tasting is sponsored by Lanny Clark with Prime Lending. Lanny Clark is a loan officer specializing in residential home lending. He communicates with you every step of the way and his honesty sets him apart from the rest. He's able to think outside of the box due to his experience and is able to tailor a loan program to fit your needs. If you can't qualify just yet, not a problem. He will let you know what you need to do in order to be ready. Lanny is also backed by Prime Lending, which is one of the biggest and fastest growing lending banks in the nation. They have simplified the home lending process down to five steps. And FYI, step number five is to relax and enjoy your new home. So contact Lanny Clark today at 510-964-0620. With just under 20,000 residents, the city of Pinole is everything you come to expect from a small Bay Area town. Nestled between Richmond and Hercules, Pinole's history stretches back to include some of the earliest native settlers in California's history. The city's rich history is preserved by the Pinole Historical Society. Today, our guest is Jeff Rubin, the president of the Pinole Historical Society and the man in charge of the Pinole History Museum. We talked to Jeff about the history of the small town and what makes it such a great place to live. Let me get some wine poured here. Yeah. So you're going to like this wine. Are we recording, Sam? Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank so you. Thank you. We're drinking out of these commemorative cups here. Yeah, these... Th- these are not really red wine glasses, but these are pretty cool cups. Yeah, these these were issued in 1996 when the Bank of Pinot Building downtown was added to the National Register of Historic Places. It's okay. One of two buildings in Pinot the other being the Fernandez Mansion that's on the National Register of Historic Places. So these mugs were issued to uh, commemorate that. It's very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, cheers. L'chaim. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me on. Now, yeah, that's Mm, really good wine. That's nice. So this wine, it's a Portuguese wine. In fact, uh, Kim, uh, Kim discovered this wine because... She was at Trader Joe's, and this picture here um, is one of the famous streets in Lisbon, in oh, Portugal. Okay. Okay. And so when her and I were in Portugal, we stayed at an Airbnb on that street. Nice. And they were filming a movie, too, the last day we were there, which was uh, kind of cool to watch. And so this wine reminded her of Portugal, so she got <laughs> five bucks at Trader Joe's. Wow. And this is really good red wine. And very appropriate because... Uh, Pinal has uh, a very, very strong Portuguese history. Yeah. Uh, the Faria House, where uh, the museum will be, uh, the Joseph Faria family uh, lived there and raised their children there. Now, where is that going to be located in Pinal? It's, uh, the Faria House is on San Pablo Avenue, 2100 San Pablo Avenue. It's right next to the bus stop. So it's about a half a block up from Quinnan Street. Okay. If you were standing in front of the post office and looking towards San Pablo Avenue, you'd be looking right at the Faria house. Okay. It's that two-story farmhouse, light green color on the outside, white picket fence, and a beautiful rose garden that's maintained by the Pinole Garden Club. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, so we were just briefly talking right before we went uh, uh, recording live a little bit about your background and uh, why don't we talk about your background just very briefly and how you ended up with the Pinole Historical Society. Huh. Okay. Uh, born in New York City, college in Illinois, former sports writer in New York and uh, Vallejo, California. Uh, I left the sports writing business in 1981. I had just turned 31, and I realized that uh, if I was ever going to have lasting relationship with anybody— uh, uh, I'd, I'd have to do it. I'd, I, I'd have to, I'd have to do it in a job where I wasn't working nights and weekends. And it's very hard to get a date 
on Friday and Saturday night at midnight. And I think the dating pool is very thin at that hour on Friday and Saturday <laughs> nights. So I went into my own business and I picked newsletters because I had all the skills to do them. I could take pictures, I knew how to write, and I knew how to lay out a publication. And those are all the skills you need to, uh, uh, to do newsletters. And so I started a business called Put It In Writing in 1981. And uh, on my 25th anniversary in uh, 2006, I changed the name to The Newsletter Guy. And in 37 years, I've probably published about a little over 2,000 newsletters, uh, some quarterly, some uh, monthly. Mechanics Bank did a monthly newsletter for almost 31 years. Now, in this I, monthly newsletter, do you write every article? I write the articles. I take the pictures. I do the entire layout. And the way it works with a monthly newsletter is you finish up one newsletter and you've already started working on the next one. Those are the monthly deadlines. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, been, it's been a great life, 37 years, still, still working. It's, it's a lot of fun. Every, That's awesome. I, I have some great clients. I, I have a new client in Houston. They, they manufacture drills, these giant drills for the oil industry. And so now I'm learning all about that. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Now, are these uh, newsletters that are usually published and mailed? Uh, or email. Most of these, most of these newsletters are in-house newsletters, so they're uh, directed toward employees. Okay. Uh, but they're also posted on uh, the company's uh, website, so I provide them with uh, with a file that they can that they can do that. And when I joined the Pinole Historical Society in two thousand eight, uh, I majored in journalism in college, but I minored in history. I had, I think, I had as many credits in history as I had. In, uh, in journalism. And uh, so I joined the Pinole Historical Society in 2008. It was a small mom and pop organization, and they were talking about doing a newsletter, and I thought, well, this is how I can contribute. And so we published our first newsletter in, I think, the fall, a summer or fall of 2008. It was two pages. It was an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper on both sides, photocopied at Staples, no color, black and white pictures, and now it's grown to 16 pages every quarter with uh, a lot of advertising. Mm -hmm. Probably have about 40, 50 advertisers. We publish, wow. two we publish 2,000 copies a quarter, and they're distributed in more than 70 locations throughout uh, Pinole and West, West Contra Costa County. We also do an e-zine, a monthly e-zine. The newsletter is mostly about, is history related. So the articles are uh, a lot of a lot of the articles about the way things were in Pinole. The Ezine is a monthly newsletter, uh, only email. Comes out on the first of the month, and it's about current history events, what the society is doing, what other societies are doing, events happening in San Francisco, like the San Francisco uh, Maritime. National Historical Park, stuff like that, Rosie mm -hmm. the Riveter in Richmond. We publicize all of those events as well. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you being a New York guy, yes. I know we had a brief conversation about the deli meats out here and how disappointing uh, it is for you to really find a good deli spot. All right, so but, I went to Augie's. Okay. So we had him on the podcast. I told you you had to go to Augie's. We went to What's Augie's. What's your review? Very good. Very good. We went to. Uh, we went there. Um Oh, what's the guy's name? Is it is, uh, Z Zeke or he has an unusual name? Au Augie's son. Augie was there. He's mm -hmm. the father, and his son was there. He's the one who no. Augie's no, the so kid. So Lex is the father. Lex, Augie's the kid. Lex, right? So uh, we saw Lex, and we saw we met Augie. Interesting young man, very well behaved, and we met Lex's father, and so all three of them were there, and they had photos on the wall. And uh, I recognized a lot of them because I'm a former sports writer. And he was very impressed that uh, I knew about um, uh, the ballpark in, in Montreal. And uh, so we got along really well. The food's terrific. Uh, I had that, uh, smoked, that smoked meat sandwich. Yeah. Uh, more like pastrami than corned beef, but really good. That's the one he brought in for the podcast, right? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. Good and so now they have a dinner menu. 
okay. That's yeah, it. yeah. They have uh, uh, their own recipes. They have uh, they have a hamburger that's that's part smoked meat and and part burger. So I'm gonna go down there and that's got to be amazing. Yeah, yeah. So I'll go down there and try that. So speaking of delis, I'm going back to New York next month, and I have I have about seven or eight delis that uh, on my list in all the different boroughs. And so my wife and I will be eating a lot of deli food and a lot of New York pizza, which is very different from pizza out here. So how's it different? I've actually never been to New York myself. Oh, well, you must go. And I know when that's you, what everyone keeps and saying. And when you do, I have, I have a Word file called New York Things to Do, and I'll send it to you. And it's got restaurants in all the five boroughs, things to do, visit in all the five boroughs, museums to go to, and then the usual stuff like the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, mm-hmm. the Circle Line Cruise, Statue, um, Empire State Building. New York pizza is uh, thin crust, uh, very cheesy, and uh, a lot of sauce. So when it comes out of the oven, you get a big wedge, a triangular wedge, and you fold it in half. And then you just go like this, and the tip just kind of bends down. And all of that oil and cheese just slides <laughs> right into your mouth. It's so wonderful. <laughs> I can't wait. I know, got, there, I know there's been uh, pizza places that I've tried to mimic, yeah, well, like New York pizza. New York-style pizza. It's not the same. And, and I'm, I'm not making a value judgment about what's better and, uh, and what's not. Uh, Chicago pizza, deep dish pizza, wonderful stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just different. Yeah. So you know, you you get used to you get used to what you eat when you grow up. Yeah. And because I grew up in New York, I'm used to uh, you know this kind of food. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, there were two delis within walking distance. I remember 1959, nine years old. My father, every Friday night, we used to go to this deli in Brooklyn, and it was right around the corner from, uh, I've heard the term soda jerk. No, I haven't. Okay. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a candy store, and you go in and they have these, they have these, uh, these uh, uh, seats uh, with the round tops, and they spin, and there's a whole, there's a whole line of them, and, and you step up, you sit down, and you order uh, an ice cream sundae or a root beer float or something like that. And and the soda jerk, that's the guy who makes it. Okay. He he presses a lever, kind of like when on a, on a beer tap, except seltzer water comes out. Okay, and that's that's how you make ice cream sodas and stuff like that. And so we knew the people who owned this uh, candy store was right next door to a deli. So my dad and I used to go on Friday nights, and we'd go to this one deli, and I'd, I'd have the same thing every Friday night. Two hot dogs, mustard and sauerkraut, side of fries, and a can of, a bottle of Dr. Brown's soda. And you can get Dr. Brown's. It's a New York-style drink. You can get it in the supermarkets here. And so guess how much that cost? Two hot dogs, kosher hot dogs, side of fries, and a soda. When was this? 1959. I would probably, 1959, I'd probably peg that at 25 cents. Well, 70 cents. 70. 70 cents. Now, that meal today, if you could find a place that served that, would probably cost you about 17 or $18. Yeah. Yeah, because the hot dogs themselves would be 5 or $6 a piece. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's what you grow up on. Bagels. You could you could uh, get dollar fifty hot dogs in Costco at Costco. Well, yeah, but they're getting you rid can. of that. No, 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 the, no. They're getting rid of the Polish sausage. Oh, okay, not they're the hot dogs. They're keeping the hot dogs. Okay. There would be a mass exodus from, <laughs> they got rid of those <laughs> from Costco. Dogs, right? They got rid of the hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're not going to do that. Yeah, yeah. So the Pinot Historical Society. What's the what's a mission and overall goal? Well. Uh, We've, we've got the Historical Society. It was founded in 1974 by George Vincent and uh, Dr. Joseph Mariotti, who was an orthopedic surgeon. He was also the uh, team doctor for Pinot Valley High School. 
and he owned the Fernandez Mansion, which is that gothic-looking haunted house building mm-hmm. at 100 uh, Tenant Avenue right by the bay. And George Now, Mid- it wasn't there always, right? That house was built in 1894. And w- was that the house that used to be where the Kaiser's at no, right now? No, that's the Faria house. Oh, God. That's it. That's where okay. our museum's going to be. Okay. And that's that two-story. Uh, that's the uh That's the Fernandez Mansion, uh, as it pretty much looks today. And that was built in 1894 by Bernardo Fernandez. And uh, he came here from the Azores. Again, this is part of Pinal's uh, long, terrific Portuguese history. Uh, he came here in the 1850s as a young man, and uh, he started a shipping business, and he ended up owning most of Pinal. He and Samuel Tennant. Hmm. Uh, and so this was the second house. The first house he built burned down, and this was his second house, and uh, Dr. Mariotti, uh, who founded the Historical Society, he and his wife Gretchen bought that house, I'm thinking sometime in the 60s or 70s, and they're both uh, past now, but uh, Dr. Joe's daughter, Carrie Joe, and his son Paul still live in that house. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting, very interesting place. Now, do we have a picture of where the museum is going to be located at? Uh, do you have uh, – uh, yeah, well, there it is. Okay. Okay, so that's the Faria house. I remember seeing this house all the time. Uh, so when I, I started real estate when I was 18, and my office was in Richmond, and I lived in Fairfield. So every single – You drive I, I, you drive pa- Exactly, right past you can it. see it from the freeway. Sure you could, yeah. It's, right, it's where Kaiser is now. And, uh, and so uh, – Okay, that, so this house has been relocated over there on San Pablo Avenue. This this is what the you're looking location. at now is on San Pablo. Avenue. Yeah, yeah. It was by Kaiser. It was moved in 2005. Yeah, I remember seeing that project. That was. It, it's always amazing to see like how they move a house. Yeah, because one mistake and you can ruin the entire structure. That's right, and uh, and of course they also had to build a foundation, so that had to be exact as well. Mm-hmm. And they did a great job. The house is in pretty good shape. Uh, uh, the walls are strong. The floors are strong. It's just gutted. There's nothing There's nothing in there. How long ago did they move the house? 2005. Okay. Yeah. So, so you weren't with the Pinola Historical no, Society? No, this, this happened, I remember when it was moved. Yeah. But I was not a member of the society back then. So, and this was built around 1880 by uh, Samuel Tennant. Tennant Avenue, Samuel Tennant. Mm -hmm. He came, interesting story with him, he was a doctor. He was the physician to King Kamehameha in Hawaii. Hmm. And he came here in, uh, I believe it was around 1849, 1850, because he had gold fever. What is that? The gold rush. The oh, gold rush right. in 1849. Yeah. People were coming from all over the place to prospect gold in the Sierra yeah. Nevada. And so he came over from uh, uh, from Hawaii, and uh, he fell in love with Rafaela Martinez. Um, Ignacio Martinez, uh, Rafaela's father, was a uh, uh, commander in the Mexican Army. And when he retired in 1823, he was awarded a land grant. And Pinole was the center of that land grant. Hmm. It was called the Rancho El Pinole. And he built a magnificent complex out where Pinole Valley Park is now. That's where the Martinez Adobe was. Okay. And he had a bunch of kids. And I think he died... He didn't live very long after that because he was he was elderly uh, at this point anyway. Uh, but he had he had a large family, and uh, he had a daughter named Rafaela who was uh, quite attractive. Samuel Tennant fell in love with her, and he never made it to the gold country. He stayed he stayed in Pinole, and he built a ranch, and his ranch was where the bowling alley is today. Okay. 
and Sprouts and that whole complex there, that's where the Tenant Ranch was, right across the street from the Faria House. Okay. Okay. And uh, and they made they uh, they grew pears and prunes and peaches and plums, and that's why Pear Street, Peach Street, um, Plum Street. What was the other one? I Interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All of those street names, downtown Pinal, are named after the fruits that uh, Tenant Group. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. So Tenant built this house for his son, James. Okay. Uh, as a wedding gift. And that fa- As a wedding gift? As a wedding gift. That's one hell of a gift, right? That's a, one hell of... Well, he was very wealthy. And uh, uh, so he built it for his son... And then the Faria family eventually acquired that house the turn of the last century. And they had, oh, they had a lot of children. I think 11 of them survived. I might be sketchy on, uh, they had more kids than that, but some died in infancy. And uh, William Faria, one of the children, uh, Bill Faria, uh, he became a prominent rancher in Pinal. And he had three daughters, and they're all still alive, and two of them live right across the street from from Kaiser, across the st- on on uh, Pinole Valley Road, across the street from Collins School, so okay. across of Henry Avenue, and uh, and they're st- and they're still around, and they are waiting for their old home to become a museum. That's very cool. Yeah. Now, when is the museum set to open? Well. I am hoping three years, three to three to five years. It's going to cost a lot of money to uh, to create this museum. Uh, the city is uh, has approved a contract with an architectural firm to bring the museum up to code. Of course, it has to be brought more than just up to code because it's going to it's going to need uh, different kinds of electrical capabilities uh, for a museum. And then we have to raise the money to create a museum, the construction costs and also the exhibits and things like that. So so you'll be needing to raise uh, We'll be needing donations. to raise a lot of money, yes. So uh, we're going to start very soon. We've hired a grant writer. Okay. And uh, uh, we are, uh, in fact, yesterday I just got a list of- uh, How much money do you think you'll have to raise? Between a million and a million and a half dollars. Wow. And that's in addition to the city funds. Well, the city owns the home. So the city has allocated $50,000 toward architectural fees. And that's, that's, oh, that's it. it. That's their commitment. Okay. Now, they are going to help us with uh, finding government grants and, and working with uh, state and regional legislators to try to find money. But in terms of the financial commitment, that's it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of money to raise. Yeah. And I believe we can do it. I believe there's a lot of support for a museum. Uh, museums, museums are great for communities. Uh, we, want, we, want to pre- we want to preserve all the artifacts and all the history of our community. Um, we want this to be a living, breathing museum. Most museums in the area, and uh, I go to museums wherever wherever I travel. Most of them are what I call static museums. So they're they're museums where uh, you walk into a room and it's decorated uh, as it was decorated in 1900. So you've got your four poster bed and your linens and your washboard, and and it never changes. And so there's no reason to go back. You've seen it once. You know what it looks like. It's in your head. No reason to go back there. Our museum's going to be different. We are going to switch out exhibits. We are going to have a a very high-tech museum. We want to appeal to young people. And It's interesting. A couple of weeks ago, someone said, well, how are you going to get parents to get their kids to the museum? Mm -hmm. And I said, that's not what we want. We want the kids to bug their parents to take them to the museum. That's our goal. 
we want to make history interesting uh, for kids mm-hmm. and 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 their parents. So it's not only about what happened a hundred years ago; it's about what's happening right now. So you want to make a lot a, of history happening so you, right now. So you want to make a high tech museum. Something with exhibits changing all the time. I I would assume with technology, you're going to make it interactive. Also. Inter- interactive, lots of video, uh, lots of lots of recordings. There will be some static exhibits because we do have to portray the history of Pinal, and we want people to know where they come from, what happened here, to give them a frame of reference. But history is ongoing. History is happening all the time. We need to reflect that. You look around uh, uh, the uh, demographic makeup of, uh, of Pinole and of Hercules. There were a lot of immigrants here. We need, we need to acknowledge their history as well because back 100 years ago, uh, there, weren't as many, uh, there weren't as many people from as many countries in this area as there are now. Mm-hmm. They all have to be represented in a museum. All of their cultures have to be represented, and we intend to do that. Okay. Sounds like it's going to be a very fun and exciting museum. I, it's it's, it's, uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. Because I agree with you. And like A lot of museums you go to are very static. Very static. And they just have the same thing over. And, it, and even when they change up exhibits... It's still not very interactive, but you're starting to see a lot more yeah. museums go that route. Yeah, you you really have to because we we are in a world now where everybody's on a device. They're on a tablet, uh, they're on an iPhone, they're on an Android, uh, some sort some sort of a device. Um, you have to make it accessible. We want to have a virtual museum. So let's say you're traveling and we have a new exhibit. And you're going to be on the road for a while. You might miss that exhibit. Or let's say you're from Pinole and you've, you've moved away, but you still, you still have ties to your old hometown and you want to know what's going on. You will be able to see our exhibits on your device. Very cool. It's very cool. It has to be that way. It just, it just has to. Some of the museums that I've been to, I mean, they have uh, an adding machine that was used by some company in 1920 and it's sitting on a pedestal and <laughs> who cares um you know it's 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 not an artifact we get i get calls all the time from people uh they want to donate things and uh and we take a lot of donations i brought i brought a bunch of things here uh today which if we can get around to it, yeah, we'll uh, get into yeah, this in I'll, a minute. I'll, I'll show you some stuff. Um, and and so uh, one woman called a couple of years ago, and she said, uh, "We have this four poster bed from the turn of the century, turn of the last century, uh, with the historical society." Yeah, be uh, interested. A, a bed frame or a bed from. Uh, 1999 wouldn't really be that no, exciting. No, right? I'm talking about <laughs> 18. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly. So I have a standard. I have a standard response when I get a call like that, and the response is, "Did George Washington sleep in that bed?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course the answer is always no. And I said, "Well, you know, you better give it to Goodwill, or sell it." Or um, there are museums in this area where they have pictures. I think of everybody who ever lived in that community, up on the wall, but with no frame of reference. Why are they there? Were they prominent? If so, how were they prominent? What did they do for the community? But no, class pictures. I mean, all of that stuff is very nice, but once you see them once, there's no reason to see them again. So we will have some exhibits like that, but most of our exhibits are going to be very interesting and I hope enthralling and very high tech and uh, oh god we've got a list of oh you know it'd be awesome to see like augmented reality where you could take like let's say your phone device hold it up to let's say an exhibit and all of a sudden you see the exhibit come to life on your phone oh that is very interesting 
I've not thought of that. What I have seen, uh, and I saw it about 10 years ago at a museum in the city, where you came up to a picture and you could take your your device and it had kind of like a, uh, not a barcode, a QR code on it, and you held it up and uh, an audio started talking to you and telling you what you were looking at. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that was really cool. How can we, how could we do that? You know, we have a walking tour in Pinal of historic buildings. It's got about 27, 28 stops on the walking tour. And, and, and I was thinking, you know, what if you could stop in front of Antler's Tavern and hold up your phone and all of a sudden you'd get a history of Antler's Tavern, your phone is talking to you. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff we want. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that'd be very cool. Look into that augmented reality. I will. That's basically what it does, except in video format. And it takes what you're looking at. So you'll use your camera. You can look at the actual display. But because your camera on your phone recognizes augmented or has the ability for that, it will create a hologram or something. It'll bring that exhibit to life. Oh, I will. Yeah, uh, the wine, 19 Crimes, does a really good job of that. So if you buy this Australian wine called 19 Crimes, they have a picture on every single label of a notorious criminal. Now, when you download their app and hold your camera to that bottle, the criminal comes to life and starts telling you their story. Oh, that is so cool. It's so cool. cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm so look into that. that. That'd be very cool. I'm going to add, once the show's over, I'm getting out my iPhone, and I'm adding that. I'm adding that to the list. Yeah, because can you imagine, let's say you have an old typewriter or something. Okay, it's old typewriter. But then you hold up your phone, and then you see how they use those typewriters back then. That'd be pretty, uh, I think, pretty rad, I think. So why don't we get into some of the stuff that you brought here? Okay. Well, speaking of old typewriters, uh, back in the day, that around the turn of the last century, uh, a woman named Jessie Howe got off a train uh, down at the old Southern Pacific Station, right down by the Fernandez Mansion. And uh, she stayed here the rest of her life. And uh, Jesse Hal Clark was uh, uh, Pinole's Poet Laureate and, uh, and chronicler of the city's history. And uh, let's see, I've got a picture of her in our book. And, you know, we've, we've done two books. This is a book that we've published in 2009, and this is a chronological history of the city from the time it was, uh, well, uh, pre-discovery by the uh, Spanish explorers and uh, uh, up until 2008. And this is a book that was published in 2015, and this is a then and now book. So in, in this book, you have uh, pictures of buildings that existed maybe a hundred years ago and what they look like now. Um, and maybe not those same buildings, but what that location looks mm-hmm. like now. And you'd be surprised. Uh, some of those, uh, some of those pictures, the same buildings are there now. And in others, uh, uh, very different. Anyway, Jesse, Jesse Clark Hell was, uh, She was uh, a newspaper woman and a newspaper columnist, and uh, all of her stuff is uh, archived uh, at the Pinot Library. And as- aside from mentioning her and her contributions uh, to the city, she wrote a book called uh, Historical Sketches of Pinole. But her grandson passed away in May and there was a memorial service, a celebration of life for him yesterday at the Pinole Senior Center. His name is Dave Clark. And Dave Clark uh, was a drama teacher, and he taught he taught at uh, Pinole Valley High School from 1967 to 2003. He founded the Pinole Community Players, which is our local theater group, on the board of directors of the Pinole Community Playhouse, he founded, co-founded the School for Performing Arts, which was a school within a school at Pinole Valley High School. Uh, 
and also a volunteer fireman for 30 years who retired as a fire captain and uh he, and he was Jesse's he was Jesse's grandson and um and he's just one of the notable people uh who've who've come through Pinol. Mm-hmm. Um, you know one thing that that I, I find amazing because I lived in Pinol for a short period of time. I live in Richmond now, but a lot of the cities here in West Contra Costa are small, intertwined with each other. And the one thing I've always found amazing is people that grow up in Pinol love Pinol so much. They stay in Pinol, and it's a very, even though it's a big community, it's also a very small community. Yes. And everyone tends to know each other. Yeah. Well. And even with uh, the large demographic changes going on and more true. immigrants, but they take on that same, they fall in love with Pinol and fall in love with Everything that Pinole they do. Been. There's a there's a lot to uh, look. I came from New York City. I love Pinole. Uh, I, I don't ever plan on leaving. I've been here uh, 34 years, and uh, it's a great town. There's there's uh, living here. Living here is really really nice. Um, getting back to uh, families that stay. One of the early families, again, is the uh, Fernandez uh, family. Uh, Bernardo Fernandez uh, built that shipping business and, uh, and that mansion, and he had a son named Manuel Fernandez. And Manuel Fernandez was a doctor. And uh, it's, it's said that... Um, We'll get pictures that, of these and uh, put them on yeah. like the Facebook. And it, and yeah. it, Camera's got it. Too. Camera's yeah. got it. Okay. And it and it said that uh, uh, Doctor Fernandez uh, delivered almost everybody in Pinal, including uh, George Vincent, who was the co-founder of our society. He was delivered by uh, Doctor Fernandez, and we get some really interesting artifacts. Uh, Doctor Fernandez, uh, you've heard of Fernandez Park? Yeah. Well, it was his land, and he donated that land to the city so that the city could build Fernandez Park. And a couple of years ago, uh, somebody dropped off a uh, a box full of prescriptions that Dr. Fernandez wrote. So can you see the date oh, on that one? Wow. Can you see the date on that? It's Let's see. August 15th, 29? Yeah, 1929. Yeah. August 15th, 1929. Wow. So we have prescription. Yeah, and we, we've got a whole, we've got hundreds, hundreds of these. Um, and, and, and I was telling Sam earlier about uh, the Ellahorst family. The Ellahorst family uh, came here in uh, the late 18th century. Uh well, the late 19th century, in the 1800s, in the 1860s, 1870s. And uh, they had five kids, five or six kids. See, now my memory's failing me. Um, but everyone had a lot of kids back then. Yeah, everyone yeah. had a lot of kids. <laughs> and uh, uh, the most prominent of those children was Frances Ellahorst. And there's a school named after her out in Pinole Valley, Ellahorst School. Uh, she taught for many, many years and then was the um, s- superintendent of the Pinole Hercules School District. So we have a picture of her in our book when she was four, four years old, uh, taken, I believe, in 1878. She lived to be 94 years old. Wow. Yeah, so got all these interesting artifacts that's it amazing is. to uh, to live until ninety four years 94 old. Ninety four years back old, then. yeah. Wow. And so, uh, uh, this this is the marriage certificate of Francis Ellerhorst's parents, Chris and Christopher, or Christina, Christina and, and Christopher, and Christopher Ellerhorst. They were both from the same uh, area in Europe, but they didn't meet until they moved to San Francisco. And then uh, they moved to Pinole, 
And then this here is Francis Ellerhorst's diploma from 1900 that certified her as a teacher. And then this... This is 1900. 1900. Wow. I like how... Uh, so this is pretty funny. If you look at the date, they had this set up to print for 1890 some year. And, they had and because it was 1900, they literally wrote a nine over yeah. the 18... Yeah. yeah, that's funny. And then this book was given to us. This is a photo book of the Ellerhorst family. And this dates back to about the latest photos in this book are around 1920. Uh, for example, this is Frances in 1910. So she was 36 years old. And this is Frances standing. That's her sister, Emma. And she's Frances is about 90 in that photo. And we have a photo of her in our book where she's four years old. What's most interesting about this book is in uh, 1915, there was the uh, Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco, a giant world's fair. Uh, the uh, Palace of Fine Arts was built for that fair. And... Uh, There are pictures in here of the Ellenhorsts. Well, here's a picture of them in 1915 when it snowed in Pinol, and they're having a snowball fight. There's snow in Wow. Pinole. Yes. There was snow it snowed in the Bay Area a couple yeah. times. But there are pictures of here of them at the Panama Pacific International Exposition. Nobody has these pictures. These are pictures that they not only took, but they photo captioned. So we know what they're, we know what they saw. It, just incredible. So they took these photos themselves, they their family. Took, and this then, is their family album. And then the family donated it to the Pinole Historical Someone Society. Someone else donated it um, to the Historical Society. Um, but this, this, was, this was a gift to the society. And these are f fabulous photographs and we get we get stuff like this occasionally and uh, it's 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 just great it's great to have a photographic record of these people mm -hmm. um, and there are there are folks who are very interested in the history of these prominent families in Pinal and so getting back to the Fernandez family there are Let's see, there was Bernardo and Manuel and his children and his children. There are six generations of the Fernandez family, and three of them are still around in Pinole. Wow. How about that? And uh, I just think that's extraordinary. Yeah. And that's so got to be amazing to know, like, your entire family history and how it influenced the city that you live in. Uh, and, and they did. Uh, uh, I don't think any two people influenced the city more than Bernardo Fernandez and Manuel Fernandez. And a couple of years ago, uh, I think in 20, 2016, Susan Fernandez, who was Manuel's granddaughter, who still lives in the area, uh, she did a program about her family's history for the Pinole Historical Society. We had about 90 people there, um, and it was great. She, it was just fabulous. And, the, and Bernardo came from Portugal, and so there's the Portuguese 
connection as well. And there were so many people who came from Portugal uh, to Panama. Yeah. There's still a prominent uh, Portuguese uh, uh, foundation here in Pinal. I mean, like a community. Yes, there is. And uh, they used to have, uh, back in the day, they used to have what was called the Holy Ghost Parade, where they would they would pick a Holy Ghost queen and her court. And uh, I believe this was held in June. Um, uh, it was uh, honoring Queen Isabella of Portugal. Um, they don't do it here anymore, but I believe, I believe it's still done either in Vallejo or Benicia. And I know there's a very active uh, Portuguese community, I believe, in San Leandro. In fact, there's a Portuguese museum in San Leandro. Hmm. And uh, uh, there are books that have been written about the Portuguese farmers and ranchers and their influence in California in the 1800s and 1900s. And many of those people lived in Pinal. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, you brought over some floor plans here. I did. So these these are floor plans of the museum. So this is the first floor. Okay. So uh, you walk in down at the bottom where it says porch, and you walk in, and the first room on the right is exhibits that's that's the former Faria house living room okay and there will be exhibits in there and uh, there are nine there are nine rooms in this house there are four rooms on the first floor and there are five rooms on the second floor so there will be a gift shop on the first floor uh, when you walk in it'll be on the left and in the back which will be up in in this area we're going to put in a, an elevator so that uh, uh, people can get into the uh, uh, first floor and, and and they can get up to the second floor for people who uh, are, are disabled you know, mm -hmm. people who are in wheelchairs okay and then this is the second floor here. and that'll be the second floor now of course this is this is just a rough diagram this is not anything that was prepared by the uh, by the architects that the city is contracting with. Are these going to be self-guided exhibit tours, or you're planning to have, we'll have guided tours? We'll have docents. We'll um, have We want to work. We want to work uh, with the um, with the schools. Uh, the historical society, which is different from the museum, there are two separate organizations that are intertwined. And the idea, the idea behind that is that the Historical Society has a mission, and the museum's mission is essentially preserving the history and the artifacts. The uh, Historical Society's mission is bringing the history of Pinole to the community. So that we do this with quarterly programs. We have four programs a year at uh, Kaiser. They have a beautiful conference room there that they let us use. And uh, now, what do you do there? Um, we have four. Uh, there are uh, ninety-minute programs, and we invite speakers. For example, when Susan Fernandez did her program, she did it there. Uh, the last program we had was called "What's in a Name." And so, you know, there's lots of street names in Pinole. Okay, so you start they're bringing down the history. Um, they're named after people. Who were these people? Yeah. Where did they come from? Why were streets named after them? Who were these families? So we had about 80 people at this program. Uh, uh, George Vincent, who's our co-founder, uh, he, he did this program. And uh, it, it was great. And so uh, our next program is on September 7th. And that's going to be... Uh, we're calling it Make History Happen. Where's that being held at? At Kaiser. So. Uh, conference rooms 2A and 2B. Uh, it's always on a Friday, usually the first Friday of se uh, September, November, February, and May. And we bring in speakers, some of them local. Some of them are from out of town. Uh, for example, we brought in a speaker to talk about the Panama Pacific uh, ex exposition because in 2015 because it was the 100th anniversary 
Mm-hmm. So we thought that was appropriate. So we try to we try to bring in interesting speakers. We've had uh, um, uh, there was a group of Rosie the Riveters a few years ago that contacted uh, Vice President Biden, and they wanted some recognition for the Rosies. And Biden invited them to the White House. Wow. So five of them went with their families, and uh, they ended up meeting President Obama. And uh, ABC TV recorded it. We have the video. And uh, so we invited the five of them to our uh, to do a program. And we called the program the Presidential Rosies. <laughs> And we showed the video from ABC Good Morning America, and uh, we did our we did our own video of of the trip. They gave us photos, and we created a video, and we set the music to Glenn Miller's "In the Mood," and it was a great it was a great program. A couple of years ago, we did a program about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, and uh, we invited. Uh, we invited uh, a group of Japanese Americans who were interned in these camps during World War II. And now they're in their 70s and their 80s, and they came and they did a program for us. So those are the kinds of programs we do. It's not all about penal history, but it, it, it's about interesting history. Mm-hmm. So we do four of those a year. We also go into the schools and we do a program for fourth graders. So in the schools, the kids learn about California history in the fourth grade, but they don't learn about local history. So we go in and we do a program for the fourth graders, a fun program, and we teach them about Pinole's history. Uh, we do programs for service groups like Rotary, Lions Club, Sons in Retirement, uh, Pinole Senior Center. Essentially, any group that wants a program can call us and we'll come out and uh, we'll do a program for them. So these are the kinds of things that the Historical Society does. We have two exhibits at the, uh, uh, at the um, Pinole Library. So that's separate from the museum. The museum board is focused totally on raising the money to get a museum constructed. Okay. Well, anything we can help. I mean, once you start uh, putting the word out there for donations. Oh, I was going to say, how much money do you have? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, uh, I would assume you go through those various donation uh, organizations that provide links and... Yes, we are... Yeah, we are. We have contracted with an organization called Firespring.org, and they are building a website for us, and it will include uh, a uh, a donation awesome. com- component. I expect this will be online toward the middle or end of August. Uh, we also have uh, donation cards, and these appear in our e-zine and also in our newsletter. And uh, for right now, before we start accepting by uh, um, uh, electronically and by credit card, people can can write a check as well. And we are a a recognized 501c3 by the Internal Revenue Service. So uh, your uh, contributions are deductible to the extent uh, that the law allows. Great. Yeah. Great. So, Jeff, I mean, thanks for bringing in all this stuff this is amazing we're gonna get some photos here um after the show okay um i know you brought some additional photos here but we'll get photos here link them up in the descriptions and that way people can take a look more in detail as to what we have here so thanks Thanks for coming on to the podcast i'm excited for this to see yeah i'm i'm very excited final product the museum and all the ideas and everything that you have i I, we have so many ideas and we're going to add this what did you call it? Uh, augmented reality. Augmented reality. We're going to add that to the list as well, and I'll be coming back to you yeah. to find out how to do that. Um, uh, we got all kinds of ideas. I just I, I cannot wait until this thing is constructed, and 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 then we can start putting these exhibits together. I just I can just see it happening in my head, and I just can't wait for it to happen. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So good luck to you. Yeah. Thank you. 
And uh, thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, it's great, a lot of fun. Great fun. And the wine was great, too. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, you have you. a little extra, too. Okay. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lemon. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. Check out our sponsors, and I'll catch you on the next episode.